Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Fernasiak, and I'm going to be reviewing the obstetrics and gynecology section. We'll start the obstetrics section by reviewing pregnancy and the basic definitions, signs, and diagnosis of pregnancy, and some of the common physiologic changes that are easily tested on the Step 2 exam. So let's begin by reviewing some of the symptoms of pregnancy. Amenorrhea is the most common first symptom of pregnancy in women who have regular menses. Any woman who presents on the Step 2 exam having missed a menstrual cycle should be suspected of being pregnant until proven otherwise. Some other common symptoms include breast tenderness, nausea and vomiting, and fatigue. Now while there's a number of pregnancy symptoms and findings on physical exam that can suggest pregnancy, it's going to be ultimately important to confirm the diagnosis with a urine or serum beta HCG level. There is a physiologic connection here. The surge in estrogen, progesterone, and beta human chorionic gonadotropin ultimately leads to many of the symptoms that we see here in pregnancy. So here we have a case which illustrates one of the key principles for the Step 2 exam. We have a reproductive age woman who presents with many signs and symptoms that we've discussed in terms of pregnancy, the most important of which is that her last menstrual period was six weeks ago. When asked what the most important next step is going to be, we're given the options of a CBC, a beta HCG, a HIDA scan, a CMP, or a urinalysis. In this case, as we discussed, the beta HCG is going to be the most important first step. A CBC can be helpful when you're looking for anemia, but it's not going to be your next test. HIDA scan can be helpful for the workup of cholecystitis, not for nausea and vomiting. A CMP and urinalysis may be helpful when diagnosing dehydration, but again, we're going to be looking for the test that diagnoses pregnancy. Now, it's important to pause here and review a couple of definitions. The offspring is referred to by different terms depending on where we are in the offspring's life. Now, some of these may not be answers directly to step two questions. However, it will be very important to understand these terms in order to answer some questions. I like to think of these across the timeline. Between fertilization and eight weeks gestation, we refer to the offspring as an embryo between eight weeks gestation and birth as a fetus, and finally between birth and one year of life as an infant. So let's review another key point, that of dating methods. So I think it's easiest to learn obstetrics by going from the beginning to the end of pregnancy and reviewing along the way key definitions, tests, complications, and treatments. At the first prenatal visit, it's key to determine pregnancy dating criteria. This is important because many milestones and recommended tests and screens are based upon an accurate age of the fetus. So reviewing a few definitions, developmental age is the days since fertilization, while gestational age is the days and weeks since the last menstrual period. On average, the gestational age is going to be two weeks beyond the developmental age, which makes good physiologic sense since ovulation occurs approximately two weeks after the last menstrual period. An easy way to estimate the date of delivery is using Nagel's rule. Nagel's rule tells us to take the first day of the last menstrual period, subtract three months, and then add seven days. In our example, the last menstrual period of July 1st, 2010, after subtracting three months and adding seven days, will give us an estimated date of delivery of April 8th, 2011. A final key point for Step 2 exam is that in the absence of a sure last menstrual period, an obstetrical ultrasound in the first trimester is going to be the most accurate and reliable way to establish gestational age. So let's break down pregnancy a bit further in order to help ourselves organize a bit better for the Step 2 exam. We're going to review the different definitions of trimesters as well as some things we may offer the mother during each trimester or things we would be expecting to see during each trimester. The first trimester is the time between fertilization and 12 weeks developmental age or 14 weeks gestational age. During this time, we could offer the mother a first screen, which is a combination of the nuchal translucency and serum markers in order to screen for chromosomal abnormalities. 
We would also obtain fetal heart tones with a Doppler in order to confirm a viable pregnancy. During the second trimester, which is between 12 weeks developmental age and 24 weeks developmental age, or 26 weeks gestational age, we have additional serum markers we can use in the triple and quad screen in order to screen for chromosomal abnormalities. We would also exp expect the mother to experience quickening or fetal movement at 16 to 20 weeks gestational age. The anatomic ultrasound is performed sometime between 18 and 20 weeks gestational age. The third trimester is between 24 weeks developmental age and delivery. During this time, there are more frequent visits and we'll begin to monitor for signs and symptoms of labor. Now this mental roadmap is very important the reason is, if you have a woman who presents with bleeding in the first trimester, you have a very specific differential diagnosis, such as spontaneous, threatened, complete, incomplete, or partial abortion, or ectopic pregnancy. This very same clinical scenario in the third trimester gives you a very different potential set of diagnoses, such as placental abruption, placenta previa, vasa previa, or even labor. So it's very important to help organize yourself based on trimester in order to make the questions easier to tackle on the step two exam. So a few more definitions to go over before we complete laying the groundwork for the step two exam. A pre-viable delivery occurs between fertilization and 24 weeks gestation, whereas a preterm delivery occurs between 24 and 37 weeks gestation. Term deliveries are going to occur between 37 and 42 weeks, whereas post-term occurs after 42 weeks gestation. There's an organizational tip here, similar to that of the trimester framework. These milestones in gestational age are key to determine what to do when a patient presents with varying symptoms on the Step 2 exam. We're going to review these in depth, but when a woman presents with labor before 24 weeks gestation, we need to be thinking about infectious etiologies and whether or not she qualifies for a rescue cerclage. If a woman presents with labor between 24 and 37 weeks, we're considering treatment with corticosteroids for fetal lung development. Whereas beyond 42 weeks, we're thinking about induction or augmentation of labor given the increased risk of stillbirth with continued pregnancy. Before we move on to another case presentation, let's briefly review gravidity and parity. Gravidity is the total number of times that a woman has been pregnant. Parity is the breakdown of those deliveries and are manifested as full-term births, preterm births, abortions, both spontaneous and induced, and living children. Remember here, if a patient has multiple gestation pregnancy, one birth is going to result in two living children. So in our lady here, we have two abortions, two children born at term, a set of twins born at preterm, and thus four living children. A mnemonic to remember this is FPAL, standing for full term, preterm, abortions, and living. So in our next case presentation, we have a 20-year-old who presents believing that she's pregnant, and we're asked which of the following is the first sign of pregnancy. We're given the options of quickening, good L sign, Leyden sign, linea nigra, or cloasma. Now all of these things are signs of pregnancy, but the first one in this list is Goodell sign, seen at approximately four weeks gestation and manifests as the softening of the cervix. Quickening or movement of the baby is not felt until the second trimester. Leyden sign is not seen until about six weeks gestation. Linea nigra in the second trimester and cloasma at about 16 weeks gestation. Now this is a first order question, and we may not commonly see questions like this on the Step 2 exam, but it certainly introduces some very important and easily testable concepts in signs of pregnancy. Here we're going to review some of the signs of pregnancy. Now I always find it easier to remember things when there is some type of physiologic connection. So it's important to remember all of these eponyms are the result of some maternal physiologic changes. So the names are less important than understanding the physiologic basis of those changes. We're going to review the sign, physical finding, and approximate time from conception, and then we'll go ahead and review the physiologic basis. 
Godel sign, as we saw, was a softening of the cervix and occurs at about four weeks gestation. Leyden sign is the softening of the uterine midline and occurs at about six weeks. Chadwick's sign is the blue discoloration of the vagina and cervix and occurs at about six to eight weeks. Telangiectasias and palmar erythema are small blood vessels or reddening of the palms and occurs sometime during the first trimester. Cloasma, also called the mask of pregnancy, is a hyperpigmentation of the face, most commonly seen on the forehead, nose, and cheeks, and can worsen with sun exposure. This usually occurs around 16 weeks. Finally, the linea nigra is a line of hyperpigmentation that extends from the xiphoid down to the pubic symphysis in the midline. It typically will occur in the second trimester. Now, Goodell sign, as well as Leyden sign, are the result of vascularization, which results in hypertrophy and engorgement of the vessels below the growing uterus, and results in softening and changes in the coloration of the uterus and cervix. Some common reasons for some of these changes are the different hormone levels in pregnancy. For example, telangiectasias and palmar erythema, as well as stria gravidarum, or stretch marks in pregnancy, are seen as a result of increased estrogen. Hirsutism and acne can be seen with increased risk, uh, increases in progesterone. Hyperpigmentation of the nipples, areola, axilla, umbilicus, and midline of the abdomen, or the linea nigra, as well as melasma and cloasma, are due to increases in melanocyte stimulating hormone. Going back to the concept that there's a physiologic basis for most of the things that we see in pregnancy can make memorizing some of this a little bit easier. So let's review some of the diagnostic evaluations in pregnancy. The first, and one of the most important, is beta-HCG. Beta-HCG is detected in both urine and serum testing, both of which are highly sensitive. There's an endocrinology connection here. We must remember that HCG shares a common alpha subunit with the hormones from the anterior pituitary, such as luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and thyroid stimulating hormone. Thus, pregnancy tests must be able to differentiate the two so as to avoid false positive pregnancy tests during the LH surge during the menstrual cycle. Let's discuss beta HCG during pregnancy. The progenitor villus cytotrophoblast cell is the stem cell of the placenta. It proliferates through gestation, differentiating along two pathways to form either cytotrophoblasts or syncytiotrophoblasts. The syncytiotrophoblast produces regular HCG, which promotes progesterone production by the corpus luteum until the placental progesterone production becomes established after six weeks of gestation. The cytotropoblast produces hyperglycosylated HCG, or HCGH, which is the principal form of HCG present during the first two post-conceptual weeks, and falls to low levels through the remainder of pregnancy. Now in the first trimester, we see a predictable doubling of beta-HCG levels approximately every 48 hours for the first four weeks. Urine pregnancy tests are positive four weeks following the last menstrual period. Peak levels of HCG are seen at approximately 10 weeks gestation, and the levels drop off in the second trimester. A key step two point is the predictable rise of HCG during normal pregnancies. You can use this tool to differentiate normal pregnancies from abnormal pregnancies, such as ectopic pregnancies or spontaneous abortions. In addition, there's a physiologic connection to some of the common diseases of pregnancy, such as hyperemesis gravidarum. The very high HCG in the first trimester with drop in the second trimester follows the clinical course of this common disease. I will revisit beta-HCG levels when we talk about the diagnosis and treatment of ectopic pregnancies. Now I want to take some time to drive home some key step two points. Ultrasound confirms the intrauterine pregnancy and it along with the beta-HCG are going to be two of your most powerful tools for diagnosis on the step two exam and of course in clinical practice. So at five weeks gestation or at a beta HCG of approximately 1500, a gestational sac should be seen on ultrasound. 
we can see the gestational sac indicated here with a yolk sac being measured on the inside. Again, this beta HCG of about 1500 is called the discriminatory zone, and once you reach that level, you ought to see something in the uterus if it is a normal pregnancy. Over the next couple of slides, I'm going to be reviewing some of the physiologic changes of pregnancy. These are easily tested subjects and commonly show up on the Step 2 exam. We're going to start with cardiovascular changes. The key ones being a cardiac output, which increases by 30 to 50 percent, and a lower blood pressure. The cardiac output increase in the first half of pregnancy is due primarily to increased stroke volume, in part due to progesterone-mediated vasodilation of the vessels, thus decreasing the peripheral vascular resistance, and in part to the increase in blood volume. In the second half of the pregnancy, we see that the cardiac output increases primarily as the result of an increased heart rate, with stroke volume returning to normal levels. With lower blood pressures, this is due to the systemic vascular resistance dropping due to the effects of progesterone, which causes smooth muscle relaxation, and vasodilatory substances such as prostaglandins, nitric oxide, and atrial natriuretic peptide. Some of the common gastrointestinal changes in pregnancy includes morning sickness, which is a little bit of a misnomer as it can occur any time throughout the day, which is caused by an increase in estrogen, progesterone, and beta-HCG made by the placenta. The nausea and vomiting typically begins sometime around 4 to 8 weeks gestation and will decrease by 14 to 16 weeks gestation as the beta-HCG levels and hormone levels return to more normal states. Gastroesophageal reflux is very common in pregnancy due to the lower esophageal sphincter tone and displacement of the stomach by the uterus. Constipation is a common side effect of pregnancy given that motility in the large intestine is decreased. In all of this, there's a key physiologic connection. Most of these symptoms are due to the physical displacement and or progesterone-mediated smooth muscle relaxation leading to decreased tone of the sphincters or decreased transit time through the GI system. In terms of genitourinary and renal changes, we see that there's an increased size of the kidney and ureters, which can increase the risk of pyelonephritis secondary to urinary stasis. There's an increased incidence of stress urinary incontinence due to compression of the bladder. And we see an increase in the GFR secondary to a 50% increase in plasma volume, resulting in a decrease in the BUN and creatinine. Here we show a renal ultrasound, which shows some physiologic hydronephrosis in pregnancy. Again, the physiologic connection here is that many of these changes are due to either mass effect or progesterone effect on smooth muscle. Some of the hematologic changes in pregnancy include increases in red blood cells, plasma, and coagulation factors. In fact, the maternal blood volume increases by 35% at term. We can also see anemia, which is largely due to the fact that plasma volume increases out of proportion of packed red blood cells. There's a clinical connection here. Maternal iron availability is key to increases in red blood cell volume. The normal pregnant patient requires 1,000 milligrams of additional iron. 500 milligrams goes into creating red blood cells. 300 milligrams is transported to the fetus. And 200 compensates for iron loss. We'll conclude the physiologic changes in pregnancy section with one final point about hematologic changes. And this is a key point that is tested commonly. So pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state for several reasons. First, fibrinogen increases 50% along with fibrin split products. At the same time, we have a decrease in inhibitors of coagulation in protein C and S. We don't see any increase in PT, PTT, or INR. And if we recall Virchow's triad, we see that two of the three points are hit in that we increase our coagulation factors and we increase stasis in pregnancy, thus leading to higher risk for clot forming.